authors like uh, this meeting is being recorded uh, for this classes for landscape success classes uh, which we started way back in uh, february um, my name is Suma Mudan. I am a master gardener for the last eight years. And we have been doing uh, several different programs to um, help the community with uh, gardening and anything garden related. This is one of those programs which uh, goes through uh, all the fundamentals of setting up a successful landscape for a homeowner. So it goes through all the basic things like soil to water to the right kind of plants to pests and uh, the, how to maintain the grass. And uh, now we are talking about trees. So fall is typically um, is for planting trees because the trees and Paul, Paul is going to give us a lot more information on how to plant them right and how to nurture them to be uh, like fully successful for the next several years. So Paul Wierzbeke is, uh, we are very fortunate to have him today because he is uh, a wealth of knowledge and he is so experienced and uh, he is an expert in this area. Um, and he has worked for the Missouri City Parks Department since 2008. He is the city forester and horticulturist. He has a BA in anthropology from Lake Forest College and an MS in Park Management from Western Illinois University. Paul has also completed two years of Peace Corps uh, service in Micronesia and two years of AmeriCorps in uh, Illinois. So Paul is responsible for plant care at Missouri City Parks, facilities and trails. And is, he is very proud to call Missouri City uh, is the community where he lives, works and plays. If you have missed the first few minutes uh, before the presentation, before the talk, Paul talked a little bit about the edible trail um, in Missouri City that goes from Missouri City to Sugarland with a lot of uh, fruit trees and nut trees. And it is a enjoyment for all the public. And he is uh, one of the key uh, implementers of that. He came up with the idea and uh, he is the one who got it up, up and running. So if you haven't, go on the trail and enjoy all the fruits of other people's labor. <laughs> so uh, without any further ado, I'm going to pass it on to Paul and we will learn all about trees today. Thanks, Paul. Uh, thank you, Surma. Uh, hello to all of you out there. I wish I could see your faces, but uh, I'll just rely that you're, uh, you're out there and you're not going to fall asleep on me. I'll try to make it as entertaining as possible. This uh, happens to be one of my favorite presentations. It's called the Tree Academy. I've given uh, variations of this to all types of different people, anywhere from working professionals to master gardeners, um, to just uh, HOAs and also uh, garden clubbers out in uh, Missouri City here. So I'm excited to be here working with uh, uh, the master gardeners group again. Uh, as Suma mentioned, I've been in the business here in Missouri City for close to 15 years in the service of the city as the city forester slash horticulturalist slash whatever the mayor needs me to be on that particular day. But uh, previously to that, I worked in Illinois, Iowa, and Minnesota, both in uh, nonprofit and also state level urban forestry. And uh, funny thing, the first year I came down to Texas, it was uh, 2008, and uh, well, that summer I had my first bout of heat exhaustion. And then later that year we had Hurricane Ike. So that was my welcome to uh, Texas Yankee experience. But uh, in a good way, it kind of taught me a little bit about what the trees have to deal with here in Texas. So it was a, a good training for me. But um, today's Tree Academy, it's, it's basically a cram of about 20 years of practical experience into about one hour. So uh, I'm not gonna inundate you guys with a lot of technical knowledge. You have all the resources in the world there at Texas A&M that can uh, bore you to death with details about tree biology and dendrology and all that good stuff. I'm gonna give you really a practical aspect uh, that you can take home with you in your own yards or educate the public uh, when you become full-fledged master gardeners. So uh, the goal is really today is to teach you a little bit about plant selection, a little bit about uh, actual tree planting, early care, basically establishment care of trees, 
And my, my real goal is to either get you guys to laugh at least one time over the next hour, or at least remember one new thing. If uh, everybody gets one of those two things, then this hour will be well spent. Uh, we'll save questions and answers for the end. So if you do have a question, go ahead and type it into the comment box and we'll address those one at a time uh, towards the end there. And uh, hopefully we'll have a good 20 minutes or so to do questions. So we'll uh, jump right into it. Welcome to the Tree Academy. All right, so the first part is here. Uh, well, one of the things that I've learned throughout the years is that uh, trees always have the power to surprise me. Uh, I sometimes think that the more that I learn about the, the intricacies and uh, balance between soil, trees, air, and even tree biology, the, the more I realize that uh, I have a lot more to learn. I guess that's why I like the profession because it's, it's non-exhaustive. But as educators, um, which certainly you guys will be helping out your friends, neighbors, or whoever else is associated with your master gardeners, you know, it's, it's not really as much about teaching them about trees, but it's more about helping them not make the really common mistakes. And that's what I think about 50% of my job is, is uh, fixing mistakes of landscape architects or previous maintenance uh, managers or current maintenance managers, all kinds of stuff like that. So really uh, good tree care just starts in the, the planning phase of things. So we're gonna do a little what I call the, the Texas tree look around. And um, we're not even gonna get into tree planting here for like 20 minutes. First, we're getting into the preparation for tree planting. Uh, this is gonna save you a lot of time and money replacing dead trees throughout the years. I'd rather you guys put that, that time and effort into really smart planning, purchase and planting on day one. So you don't have to do it again every year, replacing that tree. So whenever somebody comes up and says, oh, oh Paul, what should I plant in my yard? Well, I say, oh, just, just hold on the brakes here. Let's talk about your site. And if preferable, go to your site and we're gonna start looking around your yard and uh, looking at what we can find as far as what the site can handle. So here, uh, I like to put a lot of pictures in these PowerPoints. You'll see uh, on that top left there, we have uh, several crepe myrtles planted within 10 feet of live oaks. And you can kind of see that that's, uh, that's not a good situation. Most of you probably know that crepe myrtles thrive in a lot of sun, which these guys are barely getting. So uh, that's just poor planning. And that's something that we could uh, try to avoid as experts. On the bottom left over there, you see the tree real close to the house. Now, I honestly couldn't tell you which was there first, but uh, that's probably not gonna be a good relationship if that tree uh, continues to grow in a lot of girth or it starts falling apart at some point. That's going to be a, a real issue for that homeowner. And the bottom there we have uh, you know, one of our pavilions here at Missouri City and then uh, a live oak was planted there probably about the same time that that pavilion was put in. And what we know about live oaks is they like to grow out and downwards with their branch structure. So that's a constant problem for roof shingles and, um, and certainly uh, could happen on any of our landscapes. Then there's the old uh, tree and power line uh, coupling over there on the right hand side. Um, I don't know what you would call that pruning practice over there. I guess an L cut maybe, but uh, obviously not good for the tree, not good for the power line. Just a poor plant selection or poor plant placement. Uh, that might have been a great tree if it was planted 20 or 30 feet a little bit closer to the house and pruned up a little differently. So just some things when you're looking up in your yard, but now we can look down in your yard. So, you know, there's the, there's the fallacy that roots are these vengeful things. They want to get into your foundation. They want to get into your water lines and your sewer lines, and they want to cause mass destruction and chaos. That's really not the case. Uh, think of roots as just op opportunistic things. Um, they need easy soil movement. They need air and water and nutrients in the soil. So a lot of times where they can best find that stuff in our urban really mostly it's a compacted clay environment is you know underneath sidewalks hey all of a sudden here's this nice little pad of sand that we use to, for the foundation uh, we'll, we'll find some water air and uh, easy soil movement through there or we're getting a lot of water runoff coming off this building so let's let's get those roots shooting over at the side of the building near the foundation because that's where we get what we need um, a lot of times the roots aren't going to sit there and jackhammer through your concrete what they're going to do, though, is if there's already cracks from shifting or whatever in your foundation or your driveway, uh, they will find those those air spores, air pores, and get in there. And of course, they grow, so they're going to expand, and and therefore the uh, the concrete might 
uh, get broken up as a result of that. So that's just something to be aware of, especially if you're planting shade trees. A lot of times they have aggressive shallow roots and um, that's always a, a major concern. So the more you can space them away from hardscape, the better. Uh, we'll talk a little bit later about a lot of smaller trees that won't even cause those kinds of issues generally, but um, just something to think about. And then of course we have you know, poor drainage for the most part in the Houston area. So as we saw with uh, some of our hurricanes and, and uh, 100 year floods every other year, uh, we do get a lot of seasonal flooding and some of these uh, shock flooding and some trees can handle that better than others. And you really got to know your sites. But even within our, our microclimates and your own yard, I'm sure there's that one spot in your yard that always seems to be holding water and um, drowning out everything that you try to put in there it is possible for trees to suffocate. And that's basically what they do when they get covered with water for extended periods. It doesn't allow them to take in air from the soil. It suffocates them out. And um, actually uh, for a lot of new tree plantings, I see almost as much death by overwatering and them drowning than I do from underwatering. So it's something to, to consider. Then obviously uh, your underground utilities, water lines, sewer lines, things like that, same type of thing. Roots are opp opportunistic. So I think we were all deceived as youngsters growing up in school, thinking that a tree looks like the one on the left here. Um, the root system is like a mirror image underground of the canopy above ground. And that's absolutely not the case, especially here in our compact uh, clay soils. The picture on the right is a much more characteristic of what you're gonna expect to see as far as roots in our urban environment. In fact, on uh, most shade trees, that are commonly planted around here, those roots will extend two or three times the diameter of the actual spread of the branches. So that's something to really think about in your own yard. Not only do you have your roots, but pretty much all the neighbors within, I don't know, maybe a hundred foot radius or more of your home, their roots are in your yard as well. So a lot of trees get blamed for breaking this pipe or that pipe. It's really hard to tell sometimes where those roots are originating from. And there's different size of roots as well. You have your, uh, your anchoring roots, so those are thicker woody roots. Uh, you have your transportation roots, which are generally all underground, and then your absorbing roots, which is actually the ones that take the water and nutrients from the soil. And pretty much all of that lives in our environment in about the first six to eight inches of soil. Uh, you'd be very hard pressed to dig below a foot in your yard and find any major tree roots, even on big trees like oak trees. So just really keep that in mind when you're doing your planning for what should go into your yard. All right, now still doing our Texas tree look around and we're looking all around now. And one of the things that you can consider like the picture on the top uh, left over there is, what is your site use gonna be? Uh, this, this applies to me on a day to day in our, our city parks, you know, I, when I start thinking about a potential planning spot, okay, is there going to be a playground here? Or is there a playground here? Um, a picnic pavilion? Is there going to be some type of garden? Uh, as you guys might or might know, some plants are toxic to other plants. So you'd want to be careful. So you wouldn't want to plant a, like a black walnut next to your garden. Um, is the shade going to compete with something? Or is this an area that really needs a lot of shade? Are we going to have a pet area, a dog park, that's going to be putting a lot of salt and the soil around that tree. So these are all just kind of things to kind of roll around in your head in your own yards before you plant your tree. Obviously that bottom left is pretty characteristic of anybody who's got pine trees or even oak trees uh, in their yard or on their parkways. Uh, some people don't care about the pollen, other people do. You just gotta remember trees a living organism and they shed things just like we shed skin and hair. Um, if anybody owns a mulberry tree in their uh, front yard, I'm sure they enjoy all the, all the little red dots and the bird poop that comes along with those. So it's just something to think about when you're, you're planting your tree planting. Uh, the top right picture always kind of cracks me up. Probably most of the calls that I get are neighbor disputes, either properties that are next to parks or neighbor versus neighbor. Uh, somebody gets the bright idea they want to plant a tree or several trees right along the fence line there and Hey, no problem for the first five or 10 years. And all of a sudden this tree is big, branches, roots are getting on your neighbor's yard. And that's, uh, that's about the quickest way to become enemies with your neighbor is to uh, plant a really messy shade tree right on your fence line. So something to consider. Uh, some folks out there just love their grass. 
they got to have that perfect lawn. We've got that picture on the bottom right there with the, the nice striped landscape, well manicured, probably fertilized the heck out of it. Hate to say it, guys, trees and turf grass generally don't play nice together. Uh, if you're dealing with somebody who's just a lawn lover, I would frankly just not plant a lot of trees, maybe a little ornamental or something, but a shade tree is uh, definitely going to make it difficult to establish a really nice consistent turf, especially if you're doing something like a live oak. So I want to give you a picture of our, our grand champion here in Missouri City. That's the Freedom Oak. It's a live oak. Uh, it's in our Lake Olympia subdivision. Uh, hard, to, hard to estimate the true age of it, but I'm going to guess around 250 years, give or take 50. And it's a 100, 102 foot spread last time I measured it. So gigantic tree, but this is what I want you to, to burn into your head. That's what every live oak wants to be, if every condition allows it to be that. So try to imagine putting that thing in your, uh, in your front yard. It might be tough for most of us. Then uh, crepe myrtle is probably one of the most common ornamental trees slash shrubs that are, are planted here. Um, there's so many varieties of crepe myrtles. They all have different sizes, shapes. Some want to be more tree shaped. Some want to be more shrubby. Um, a lot of the tree shaped crepe myrtles that are common on the market, they want to be a 30 or 40 foot tree. So you really have to anticipate that uh, before you put that that cute little crepe myrtle in that five gallon uh, bucket right next to your house. That wants to be a 40 foot tree. All right, so uh, we, always, we always see this, uh, this common thing over here with the uh, trees and the power lines. It's gonna be a, a battle at the, until the end of time over here. But uh, I wanna give you guys a little tale about Ridgeview Park. Uh, it's a little project that we did to try to address this on a public education standpoint. Uh, the picture on the left is the park and when I first got here there was probably about three or four trees that looked like that that were right underneath the distribution lines. Uh, there were hackberries and paper mulberries which is you know kind of our native little some people call them garbage trees uh, very prone to decay things like that so when they get pruned like this by the power company uh, they can become very quickly potentially hazardous because they they are prone to decay. So to combat that, I teamed up with the power company. We did something called the Right Tree Trail. And uh, again, this is Ridgeview Park. It's right off of Highway 6 in Glen Lakes Lane. And I said, hey, guys, why don't you guys as a power company, let's just take those trees out and let's replace it with the right tree. You, you all have probably heard of right tree, right place. And I said, well, let's, let's put this in the ground. Let's actually show people these trees in the flesh. And that's exactly what we did. We uh, planted on the first go around about 33 uh, trees. They're all small class trees. So that's stuff that you could either plant underneath the distribution line or within say about 10, 15 feet of one. They can grow to their full potential and not conflict with the power lines. Then that, that was in 2009, we put that initial phase in and then 2011 came back and did 11 additional trees, which I call the middle uh, size class trees. And uh, those are the trees that are appropriate to plant, you know, say 30 feet or more away from the power lines. And the best part about it is the power company paid for everything. So we put some nice interpretive signage up there. It's a little example of the sign on the uh, bottom right. And uh, it's a good chance for people to come out there and see some of these choices that might work in their house. It happened to be good timing because uh, this went in, uh, the first phase went in right after Hurricane Ike. So a lot of people had lost their trees during that time and they were looking for replanting. So this was a good chance to uh, help them pick the right trees for the right spot. Okay, so now that we did our, our uh, site look around, we, we kind of know a little bit about what our site can handle. Let's actually get into plant selection. We're not planting trees yet. Hold your horses out there. We're just gonna talk about, okay, we know the site, now what will fit in that site. Here's a, a little Chuck Norris tree. It was able to withstand the SUV attack over here. All right, there's, there's kind of a general rule. Don't really get stuck to this, um, this rule of tens, but it's kind of a nice general guideline. Uh, they say that you shouldn't plant more than 10% of your tree population in one species of tree. 20% uh, shouldn't be of more than one genus or of the same genus, and no more than 30% should be of one family, say um, your tropicals like citruses versus you know pines and evergreens versus hardwoods. So. The real message here is diversification. 
um, from from a large scale like managing several city parks to even in your own yard if you put just like 50 percent or more of one species well what happens if the freeze comes and it happens to knock out that one species or what happens when a new aphid or spider mite comes to town uh, we, we've seen this on a large scale in the past up in the, uh, the, the northern part of the country with Dutch elms disease. Uh, it used to just be American elms lining all the trees up, all the trees up there. Dutch elms disease uh, pretty much cleared out all of those trees in the upper part of the country. We're, uh, we're experiencing this uh, in lots of, the, uh, lots of the United States with the emerald ash borer. It's a similar borer beetle. It is in Texas. Uh, first identified, I want to say, about two years ago in Texarkana, and I'm, I'm certain it's here. And uh, it has the uh, potential to basically wide, widespread destruction of all of our native ash trees. So major forest pest, but also happens to affect trees that we see commonly here. A lot of Arizona ash, a lot of green ash. Um, and that picture on the right, that's one of the neighborhoods here in Missouri City. It's all live oaks. So what happens if oak wilt starts moving into our area or some other oak pest? Imagine that neighborhood without those trees in it. So a little diversification would go a long way. And I think a lot of people are starting to realize that. All right, so I wanted to give you guys a little bit of taste on some of my favorite trees uh, for Fort Bend County, just based on trial and error that I've been using here. I'm only going to focus on small trees because the reality is, guys, is that in your own yards, unless you're one of those fortunate few that has the two or three or more acre property that everybody dreams of, uh, the rest of us are stuck in these little eighth of an acre, a quarter of an acre, maybe a half an acre if you're lucky, uh, pieces of uh, land that we can plant in. And a lot of times, especially if you're in an HOA, they've already required you to plant several shade trees. Uh, probably in the front yard. So honestly, we don't have a lot of space to do anything but small trees. So that's really what I'm going to focus on. Um, if you have specific questions about other trees in the medium or large size class, you know, you can reach out to me either at the end of the presentation or, or I'll have my email address up there and we can get into it. But we're just going to focus on small for now. These are in no particular order of importance. It's just a nice little countdown thing. So the first one here is uh, the persimmon group. Now our native uh, persimmon, it could get pretty big. It could get probably about 40 feet tall. So that, that's certainly out of what I would consider a small tree uh, habit, uh, but it, it's still a very valuable tree. And you'll see uh, the fall color on that is uh, pretty amazing. It's, it's pretty hard to beat. And of course the persimmons are edible uh, fruits. You want, you want to definitely make sure that they're ripe before you eat them. If you've ever tried a unripe persimmon, it's uh, it's a mouth numbing experience. But um, I'm really liking the Texas persimmon and also Mexican persimmon. Those are smaller varieties of trees that are becoming more commonly available in the nurseries, also with edible fruits. And uh, they tend to max out at about 10 or 12 feet tall and, and spread as well. The Sweet Bay Magnolia and Little Gem Magnolia. Uh, these are two of my favorite smaller magnolias. Uh, Sweet Bay is one that is, is what I call semi-deciduous, so depending on how cold we get in any given winter, if it's a cold winter, it will lose its leaves, uh, say around December, early December, reflush back in February. If we have an exceptionally warm winter, it will keep its leaves. It will just look a little thin. Uh, nice little small white flowers. Uh, the little gem magnolia is just a dwarf version of our true southern magnolia, but uh, it seems to hold its color very well. Giant, beautiful flowers. Kind of a brown under underside to the leaves where the sweet bay has more of a grayish underside but uh both totally gorgeous trees and um of all my magnolias out there uh during that winter freeze we had a couple of years ago <coughs> i thought for sure the magnolias would be one of the ones to get zapped they seemed relatively unaffected so that's awesome uh there's several viburnums out on the market the only one that i uh, truly plant anymore or recommend is the Walters viburnum. It doesn't get very big, probably about 10 foot height and spread. It's going to be real shrubby. If you want to try to make it into a tree, you're going to have to put some work into it. But uh, the winter characteristics are really neat. It has kind of a reddish purplish leaf color in the early winter. And then uh, kind of the late winter, early spring, it'll just be like a big cotton ball of white flowers. Uh, not too much else is flowering at that point in time. So it's, it's a real treat. 
Texas olive, it's not a true olive. Uh, some people say that you can, in fact, eat this olive. I have not tried it and I don't rec really recommend it. Um, so I don't think it's been really tried and, and true in our area. But uh, as far as an ornamental quality, really neat little tree. Seems to have these white flowers that kind of come and go throughout the warm season, you know, spring to fall. And uh, really doesn't get much bigger than about 10, 12 feet uh, from what I see here in Fort Bend County. A little tough to find in the nursery trade, but if, if you do, I would definitely rent pick, uh, recommend picking one up. They will die back a bit in the winter if it's exceptionally cold. The Chinese fringe tree, uh, that's, that's one of those that gets a little bit bigger, probably get about 20, 25 feet tall. Um, same spread, but a beautiful flower display in, the, in uh, kind of the late spring, real early summer. Um, I don't notice a lot of pests or disease that seems to bother it, so it's, uh, it's a relatively tough tree, and I think uh, should be a little bit wider spread here in our area. Mexican plum is, in my opinion, the best prunus or, or stone fruit uh, tree, if you want to call it, for our area. Uh, it does have some thorns on it, so, so be careful of that. And um, it does need uh, proper drainage. If you put that in a low spot, it's really going to struggle and probably die on you. Uh, so this is one for those little higher and drier areas. These are edible plums. They don't get big like the ones that you find in the stores but I have heard of people making uh, jellies and things out of them with some success. Uh, a neat little plum tree. And um, when it does flower in the early spring, it's about the nicest smelling thing other than magnolia that's out there. Uh, lots of different types of hollies will grow. There's a, a million different varieties available on the market now, but as far as sticking to a, just a true natural form, I love the possum haw holly. This is the deciduous. Uh, holly. It's got a little bit uh, larger fan leaf, as you can see in the picture there. And, you know, this is this is what you expect to see in the wintertime when uh, it's kind of blase out in the landscape. You can put one of these guys in there and not only is it a good uh, food source for birds, but it's one of the few ornamental things that you'll have in the dead of winter. Uh, as far as uh, plant it and walk it away, type, walk away type of uh, trees or shrubs, the Vitex really ranks up there. Uh, this is a semi-desert climate tree, so definitely it has to be a, put in a higher, drier area. Uh, this is one of those trees that will flower pretty much all through the warm season. You'll, you'll see it start up in the spring, and then it'll kind of go back and forth all, all summer, then really sprout back out again and uh, bloom back out again in the fall. Won't look like much in the winter. It is deciduous, and uh, the pollinators love it. This, uh, this will be covered with honeybees every time it's flowering like this. They do have now, uh, the, the, true, the true variety is this purple flower like you see here, but they are starting to make a pink flowering variety and white flowering variety now available in the market. This is one of the faster growing trees that I know of. Uh, if you plant it in the right spot with that good drainage, you can expect it to probably double or triple in size within two years. Uh, next, I wanted to kind of throw this uh, little guy in here, the pineapple guava. It's not a true guava. I don't know why I got a, that name. I guess. I guess these kind of look like guavas that you buy at the store, but they are edible fruits and uh, I've been told edible flowers as well. Uh, it, it, it becomes very dense and shrubby. It's definitely more the, sh uh, the shrub than a tree. You can try to form it up into fewer trunks, but you'll have to really work on it. Another one that I'd call semi-deciduous, if we have a particularly warm winter, we will have those leaves all year. If it cools off, they'll drop its leaves and then reflush in the spring. Neat little shrub. And I had to throw the fig in there. Uh, if you're going to have some kind of backyard edible garden, uh, fig is awesome. It's, it's about as tough as they come as fruit trees. Not too many pests will bother it. In fact, the biggest pest, I think, is the mockingbirds because they always seem to know the day before it's ripe and they will take one little peck at your figs and you'll go in there and you'll have holes in all your figs. But uh, my only real complaint with these figs are is they can get very top heavy and kind of stringy like you see on that picture on the left. And sometimes those uh, trunks have been known to split off of the main trunk or it's easy breakage if it's in a windy area. So that's just something to be aware of if you plant some figs. Here's some other notables. I won't get into too much detail on all these. Uh, like I said, those crepe myrtles, there's so many varieties out in the market now. I just read those labels carefully and, and pick one that works for the size of the space that you have. Wax myrtles, honestly, I'm on the fence with them. They're a great tree for about 10 years and then they die. 
So if you're willing to accept that and replace it every decade, go for it. Uh, the palm meadows uh, is really a, really only a native palm here in uh, Fort Bend County. So um, obviously a very small one. It's not going to be a tree like a lot of the, the palms you'll see in Galveston and whatnot. The true olives, there's two great varieties, those Arbequinas and Missions. Uh, they'll both have um, fruit that's not necessarily edible, but you can make oils from them. It's a, it's a cash crop down in the valley area um, in the South Texas. Uh, it will be affected by a deep freeze here. And generally, uh, if the big freeze we had two years ago, all of mine pretty much died back in about, uh, maybe about 75% of them actually came back, but they looked pretty rough uh, for uh, definitely the first year. Asian silver bell is a great one. It's also called Cynojacia, really beautiful white flowers. Pomegranates are a great little fruit tree slash shrub. Uh, they can get a little thorny though, so they're, they're a little bit mean when you try to prune them. Obviously, Yopon Holly is a big part of our, our Houston area landscape. Uh, Sweetwood's another great tree. It has a very nice aroma coming from its roots and bark. Kumquat and Setsuma are, are two of the more cold hardy citrus family plants that you can put in. Um, all of mine died during that freeze. None of, none of the citruses were cold hardy enough for that freeze, but uh, these will generally survive a normal Texas winter very well, the kumquat and the satsuma. The ratama, there's a lot of different names for it. Uh, some people out in the uh, Austin area call it the Palo Verde. Some people call it Jerusalem thorn, but it's a very desert climate looking type of tree and it's well suited for high and dry areas, has really nice uh, white flowers, almost characteristic of like a mesquite if you look at it from a distance. Uh, very tough tree though, uh, not exceptionally short lived or cold hardy. I'm um, sure most of you have experienced red tip botina. Anakwa is a really cool little uh, native tree called sandpaper tree. It's called that because uh, if, you, if you rub the texture of the leaf, it kind of feels like sandpaper or a cat's tongue. Uh, it, can, it can get real shrubby and, and throw up a lot of suckers like uh, crepe myrtles do, but a uh, fine tree. Uh, dog, the rough leaf dogwood is uh, probably the only dogwood that I would recommend. Uh, for our area. Uh, the good news is you probably already have one in your yard and you don't even know it because those things, uh, especially this time of year, they get picked out by the birds. They like that fruit and then they like to poop them all over your yard. So I'm sure you have little dogweeds growing all over. Uh, loquat's another uh, good fruit bearing tree. That's if you want to have something that fruits in the, the late, eh, kind of mid to late winter, January, February, they have kind of an apricot type of fruit. And I had to, of course, throw a pine in there. The Japanese black pine is one of the much smaller ornamental pines, uh, very tough. It doesn't seem to be bothered by uh, some of these common pine beetles that have been uh, affecting a lot of our loblolly pines and things like that. So those are some of the best of the best of our, our uh, trees for this area in Fort Bend County, in my opinion, small trees. All right, so you got the perfect space. You know everything about your site, right? We, we found a good tree that might fit into your site and fits the needs of your house. And now we've got to get that uh, how to plant down here. So there's that saying, don't plant a $100 tree in a $10 hole. Well, you could also have a well-prepped hole and a poor quality plant. So I guess that goes uh, vice versa as well. So I'm going to teach you guys a little bit about the best way to plant a tree, actually the best way to uh, select a tree from the nursery. And then we'll talk about how to plant it. So let's get that uh, well quality $100 tree over here. So these are basically things to, to look for at the nursery. Uh, you definitely want to look for a healthy canopy. So I tell people don't get hung up on the healthy canopy as far as the branch structure though. Uh, you can do some pretty extensive pruning on a young tree and really work that tree well and uh, it'll bounce back and respond very quickly to that. So don't look for that perfect tree as far as branching. If you happen to find it, great, but don't make that the selling point. Uh, rather, what you're gonna be looking for is defects in that canopy, say wilting leaves or sections of the tree that seem off color. Uh, definitely any insect uh, presence over there is a bad sign. Uh, good, good trunk taper is probably more important at time of nursery. And what trunk taper is is when you're pulling on that trunk of the tree and you're, you're seeing it in the pot, if, you're, if it's really wiggling in that pot, if it doesn't look like those roots are set in very well at all, that there's a lot of separation between roots and soil, 
Uh, it's probably uh, probably a defect with the actual nursery there. They might be just repotting them very poorly. So I like to have some uh, good solid trunk in that pot when I get it out. And uh, the root flare, which we'll talk about a lot over the next couple of minutes, is uh, very important. I like to see that at the in the pot. I like to see it above the soil line. And I'll show you a little bit more about what that looks like. Nursery men generally don't like it when I come over there because I start taking trees out of pots. I start sticking my hand in the side of the pots looking for roots and things like that. I kind of make a mess. So they kind of see me coming, but the good news is for them, if they do a good job, I usually buy several thousand worth of trees from them. All right, so we've talked about root flare. Here's a, a glaring example on the left of a root flare. That's basically the, the point in the tree where the trunk stops and the roots start. It's those first woody roots on the tree. On the right, you see an example of a, a tree in the pot there. You can see those first woody roots. That's really a great indicator of whether or not the tree was managed in the nursery well. Uh, some nurseries get a little sloppy with this, and then every time they move it up to a bigger pot size, they'll just pile more dirt along the side of, or, um, along the trunk over there. And that root flare might be four, five, six inches deep in that pot. That causes a lot of problems, not only for the young tree, but a lot of long-term problems as well. So that's definitely something you wanna try to keep your eyes on at the nursery. Uh, other no-nos, I'm sure we've all seen the, uh, the roots exploding out of the side of the pot or underneath the pot. Uh, I'm, I'm usually less concerned when they're coming out of the bottom of the pot unless they're really set in there. When I see them exploding outside of the side of the pot, I know they've been in there way too long. Uh, obviously, a lot of roots coming up above the soil is not a very good sign. If you don't see that root flare, that's not a good sign. If you see a lot of broken branches or damaged trunk, it kind of gives you a sign that it's, it's probably a sloppy nursery. They're not handling their plants well. Obviously, if you see any type of insects, I would stay away from it. Uh, just, the nursery man might say, hey, we already sprayed for this and that. And it might have been the case, but uh, it doesn't mean it's killed the eggs of uh, whatever that insect was because that's ready to hatch as soon as you put it in your landscape. So just take a pass on that. Any leaf discoloration, that could be a bacterial thing. Uh, but it also could be a hydration problem. And again, it's, it's either you're buying a diseased plant at that point, or you're dealing with a nursery who's probably not at the top of their game. And then girdling roots, which we'll get into a little bit more here. Here we go, the girdling roots. Those are those twisted woody roots that you'll see, you know, sometimes coming out of the pot or sometimes as soon as you take that bucket out. And um, this really is a problem because if, uh, if you put a tree like that one on that left picture over there into the ground and you don't break up or cut those roots, they'll continue to spin in that general direction in a big circle uh, as they grow and mature. And you could have you know, a 20, 30 inch diameter tree that's still taking that circular path with all, with all its root growth. We want those roots to go out like that earlier picture. That's what a tree uh, naturally does, and that's how it survives storms and other things like that. So watch it. If, if you take a tree out of the pot or if you notice in the nursery that, that it seems like a lot of these trees have this really thick, woody, uh, circling roots, you might want to take a pass on that. On the bottom picture there, you see a, a tree that was excavated after a couple of years, and that's my case in point right there. You can see how those roots continue to grow and circle. And inevitably, what you find is uh, something on the right there. Um, the roots just basically choked out the stability of the tree. In some cases, it actually chokes out the ability of that tree to take up water and nutrients from the soil. So girdling roots are definitely a silent killer and a long-term killer. So what can you do? Um, as a general practice, even if uh, I trust the nursery and it's not too bad out of the pot as far as circling roots, I still cut them. And, you know, I, and I keep it simple. I just take my, my shovel and I'll kind of score the side of the root ball maybe in about four or five different sections, just to break up any of those twisting roots, get them growing on the right path. Don't worry about killing your tree. Uh, the, the roots can take a lot of abuse at, uh, at the young part of their life, at the establishment period of their life. The same with the, the canopy. Uh, it's, it's like the little kids, you know, they fall at the playground and they're crying for about five seconds and they're back playing. Trees are kind of the same way. Now, if I fall off the swing set, I'm crying for a couple months as an adult. So think about that in the, in the same way for trees. So definitely fluff up those roots, cut those roots, shave those roots, whatever you want to do, but 
you can see that picture on the top right there. That's really ultimately what you want from your tree is a nice root system where those roots are growing outward and that you can see that flare even after the time of planting. Okay, so you know your site limitations. You know your perfect tree. Uh, you've got good quality nursery stock and now we can actually grab our soils and uh, or grab our, our shovels and start working on the soil here. All right, as Suma mentioned, fall is a great time for most tree planting. I would say fall to spring uh, for most of your deciduous trees and most of your evergreens as well. Of course, you never know if we're going to get another crazy winter with a, a freeze, which is brutal on any type of tree, whether it's deciduous or evergreen. But in general, I, I like to start our planting season here in Missouri City around October, and I'll keep going and try to wrap everything up around March. Uh, reason being there is, especially for deciduous trees, you're not dealing with as much transplant shock, you know, getting beat up by the wind as you're driving from the nursery and it's hanging out your window or the back of your truck. Uh, a lot of times uh, the tree will react by dropping its leaves if the leaves are already flushed out. So it's not an issue uh, when it's winter. Uh, most of the time, this time of year, the fall and the winter is when a, a tree naturally, most of them divert a lot of their energy into establishing more uh, root growth, establishing a little bit more wood taper, a little bit more girth on their trunks and branches. And then they just kind of store all that energy in their buds for the leaf flush next year. So there's a little less shock by planting them now. But if you're going to do a citrus or a palm or one of these semi-tropicals that you see all over the place, I would definitely wait till spring. Uh, usually we're past the, the major cold frost danger by end of March. Sometimes we'll get that freakish thing at the end of March, but usually by April we're in the clear and heck, over here we might already be in the 90s. All right, so we get to the planting hole. And uh, the, the rule of thumb is you want to dig your hole two or three times the diameter of the roots. Um, if you only dig, dig in a hole just the same size as the pot, and fundamentally in clay soil, all you're doing is just putting it in another pot. Uh, all it's going to do is really make it difficult for those uh, feeder roots to really penetrate through that generally compacted clay soil, and uh, they won't spread like they will, but, 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 uh, like they should. So if you dig that hole two to three times as wide, you really break up that soil, makes it real easy for those roots to start spreading out horizontally, which is absolutely what you want. You'll get quicker establishment that way, uh, send that tree off in the right way. Again, pay attention to that root flare. You always want to see that above the ground. Um, I don't care after you put the backfill in, after you put all your mulch in, I still want to see that root flare. Some people make the, like to make the little uh, the mulch bowls around trees and things like that. That's fine if you want to do that, uh, as long as you're not burying that flare. Uh, then you know you haven't planted it too deep. Uh, chances are, if you do bury that flare too deep in the soil, what ends up happening is all those, especially feeder roots, they start growing upward. Generally, they'll grow upward right into your mulch, which is fine for early survival, but then once that mulch dries up or, or whatever, those roots will instantly die out because they're in, in, in essence an artificial soil at that point. So keep that root flare visible. This is kind of a little game I like to play with people. Maybe it's a good like kind of half break for y'all, but uh, we'll do a little mantra. So everybody, uh, if you can see me, we'll, we'll start with one of these guys. And I like to, when I'm doing planting programs, I'll get all the volunteers before they start digging to do this. You find your root flare, don't let it hide. Dig your hole shallow and wide. So if you, you do that little tree planting uh, prayer before, you'll remember, don't go crazy digging this uh, really deep hole that you're just going to end up filling with soil anyway. All right, so getting into soil conditioning. A lot of people think they have to buy all this fancy stuff and put miracle Grow in the soil and all this other thing. That's really sometimes counterproductive. I, I re really tell people don't put more than 20% foreign soil, whether it's compost or, or anything in with the native soil, because you really want that tree to adapt to the native soil as much as possible. All you're really doing is babying a real small microclimate. And um, chances are, if you have this really nice, porous, high fertile soil just in the planting hole, and then it's hard compacted clay everywhere else, well, I'm not going to go into the clay. I'm going to stay in that little hole and you're not gonna have a uh, really good uh, root structure on that tree. Uh, you wanna break up those large chunks of uh, clay 
or any other material, get all those uh, little pieces of rock and concrete out there. It's fine if you keep rocks in there too. You know, sometimes that helps open up pore space. Uh, you just don't want really big chunks because then you have too much pore space and then water will sit in there and collect and in essence drown those uh, young roots. If you have very uh, a poor drainage area, which most of our soil is likely to be, um, I'll burn up a little bit. You know, I'll create a little two to three inch mountain and then I'll have even the root flare above that. And then I'll kind of bring the soil in and, and create just a micro berm for that tree. You don't want it to be too big because, again, that it could dry out very quickly as well in our hot, dry summers. So just a slight two or three inch berms uh, seems to work. Uh, the most important thing is, is you don't want that bottom half of the root ball, or I'm sorry, the top half of the root ball to sit in standing water for a very long time. If the very bottom of the root ball is in, in water for extended period, Generally, that's okay, but that top half of the root ball is really the ones that you count on uh, to start spreading throughout your, your yard. And um, really, fertilizers aren't needed or recommended. I do have a little witch's brew that I like to put in with a lot of the city trees. Uh, it, it consists of worm compost, which is great stuff. I put some biochar, which is basically just uh, carbonated coconut. It's burnt coconut. Um, I put some mycorrhizal fungi spores, which is like a beneficial fun fungus that lives by the, the fine root systems of the tree, helps it feed itself. And then sometimes I'll put uh, water hydration crystals if it's going to be a, a not often irrigated area and those things kind of suck up the water and keep it there for a little bit longer than uh, the natural soil does. But I put very little of that stuff in there, um, generally only about 10 to 20 ounces of that collective witch's brew uh, per planting hole. So uh, really try to just improve your native soil by breaking it up, digging that, that nice wide hole. And that's the best thing you can do. Uh, it is good to mulch young trees. Uh, there's, there's a lot of advantages to mulch. Uh, the biggest is, you know, there is some nutrient cycling done over time, usually about two or three years later, that mulch is becoming your new organic soil. Uh, definitely have that re uh, moisture retention benefit that mulch can provide. And uh, most importantly for us here in the parks is it's protection from lawnmowers, weed whackers, all kinds of stuff that's uh, ready to damage the trunk of that tree. Uh, young trees can't take too much damage on that lower trunk because they could easily be girdled and uh, kill the tree. But um, you can see the, the picture on the left there. I don't know if that little like two inches of mulch is helping that tree much, probably not a whole lot. Uh, the one in the middle is kind of what you want to see, a nice wide circle about two to four inches high. Uh, go as wide as possible. If you want to turn your whole front yard into to mulch, I think that's the best thing for your tree. Your HOA is probably not going to like it, but hey, if you love your trees, what are you going to do? Uh, you see a lot, of, especially commercial areas, these mulch mountains, mulch volcanoes, whatever you want to call it. Uh, that's not good for the tree. What's what's going to happen with that tree on the right is, again, those feeder roots are going to start growing way up into that mulch, and that's artificial soil. They're going to dry out and die. Uh, I'll see kind of uh, rodents and things. They'll start nesting in there. Fire ants absolutely will love that, and um, since that trunk is constantly moist as well, you're probably going to get some fungus problems uh, growing in the, the lower trunk, so try to avoid that. As far as different types of mulch, um, just any biodegradable material is what I recommend. I use, I use mostly just shredded hardwood mulch. It's cheap. It's readily available. You can get fancy with colored stuff. It's not bad for the tree. I've heard pine straw and other things have been used. Um, it's more of an aesthetic thing than I think a practical application. So just anything biodegradable and uh, organic is good. As far as staking goes, um, it is good to to stake, uh, especially if you put bigger trees in there, if you say do anything bigger than about a 15 gallon potted tree, especially shade tree, uh, you're probably gonna deal with some stability issues here. We do have some pretty strong winds from time to time. Um, so as far as uh, strapping, I don't, I don't know if it ladies use nylons anymore, but that used to be really good strapping when I was younger, I would always tell everybody, save your nylons, I'm gonna use them to tie up my trees here. And I seem to, to break apart and biodegrade uh, about one or two years later, which is what you really want. Um, the modern day approach to that is this arbor tie stuff. It's basically a woven nylon. I like it because it's not abrasive like metal. It tends not to dig into the, the wood of the tree. Uh, I also use a lot of this rubber chain, which again has some flex and it doesn't girdle the tree. 
as a, as a general rule of thumb, I like to leave my staking material in for two hurricane seasons. For about probably 90% of the trees that I've planted after two hurricane seasons, they're good to go. They don't need supports anymore. Um, you don't wanna leave them in much longer than that. Or um, if you do have to leave it in, if the tree's not stable yet, I would definitely try to adjust it so you don't run into problems like we're seeing here in these pictures. Again, that's uh, it's starting to gurgle the tree on the left over there. In some cases that tree's wood might actually start growing over the metal and that becomes a permanent part of the tree. Kind of like this T-post did on the, the tree to the right. If you guys have ever tried to wrestle a, a, a T-post out of a tree that's been sitting there for five years, <laughs> you know it's not fun. But um, after two hurricane seasons, go back to your tree, give it the pull test. If you pull on that trunk of that tree, and if you can look down on the soil, and if you're still seeing the outline of that original root ball starting to move around in the soil, I might give it another year with the staking material. But if you're pulling on that trunk and you're not seeing that original root ball, it's looking pretty stable, get that staking stuff out of there, get those T-posts out of there, it's ready to go. Um, as far as establishment of these young trees, there's, there's kind of a nifty little saying in the forestry world, it says uh, uh, year one it sleeps, so year one after you plant it, it really just doesn't do much, it's kind of in a, a shock for the first year. Year two it creeps, so you might get a little bit of growth, hopefully you're going to get especially some good growth in the root system, maybe it's starting to get a little bit better taper there, and then year three for most trees it starts to leak, year three it leaks. So usually after about three years in the ground, uh, that thing's ready to go. You can ease off on the watering. You can obviously take the staking material off. You might wanna still replenish mulch every couple of years if you want to. Um, it seems like this period takes a little longer for the larger trees than it does for the smaller trees. So if you put in, you could probably put a, a 10 gallon oak tree in right next to a 200 gallon oak tree and in five years, they're going to be identical looking because those young trees are so vigorous, they establish more quickly, and uh, they'll catch up very quickly. But if a lot of people need that instant bang for their bucks, so they go out and buy a 200 gallon tree for a thousand bucks, and you know, it just peters along for about three or four years before it really does any growing. So I guess it really depends on your, your patience and preference. Right, as far as watering goes, um, really the trick is, is that. Uh, you can't water enough at time of planting. Just saturate the heck out of that thing. Flood that hole, really get it nice and moist. Uh, water down all that soil around the tree. Uh, it will drain, trust me, it's not gonna drown it on day one. But um, then you really just wanna try, the goal is constant moisture during that first year. Not flooding, you don't want standing water, but you want as much constant moisture as you want, especially for that first summer, that's critical. Uh, I mentioned earlier these moisture retention pellets. Uh, this picture on the left there is TerraSorb. That's one of the products. There's many out there that are basically a little, they look like sea salt size when they're dry and then they expand into like small sponges as they get wet. Holds that water a little bit well if you're unable to plant on a routine or uh, water on a routine basis. Uh, we use a lot of different types of slow drip water bags in our park system. On that uh, picture on the left there, that's a product that's called the Use to Ooze Tube. You can't see them, but there's little release nipples on the inside, lower part of it, and they just kind of slow drip over the, the point of about three or four days, uh, adding uh, just a constant low stream of water to the immediately to that root system. I like those also because they're a little bit, again, a barrier from sun exposure, from desiccating that soil, and also mechanical damage. Uh, I also have found many, many different amphibians living in those bags. Frogs seem to love them. Occasionally, I'll see some snakes in there, uh, different light types of uh, lizards as well. And of course, fire ants, everybody's favorite. Uh, if you're going to hose water, you know, go stick that hose out there and put it on a real slow drip. Go get a cup of coffee, come back 10 minutes later. Just let that soil just really saturate for a, a slow amount of time, then you won't get as much runoff. Uh, if you have uh, an actual installed irrigation system, uh, you know, your trees diff need different water than, than your grass. So, you know, just, just anticipate that trees just need a, a really long drench and then a little time to drain where, uh, where grass needs almost constant drenching, especially during this, uh, these hot times of year. All right. So 
You got your tree in the hole. Everything's looking good. You think you got your strategy down. Uh, now we're going to get into some of the essentials for like the first couple of years after your tree's in the ground. Big one being, of course, pruning. Um, winter is, in my opinion, the best time to prune. Basically, uh, you can prune anytime you want, and some things warrant uh, pruning during a warmer time of year, but winter, which for us is basically November through February, that's when you really have minimal risk from insects or diseases out in the environment. They're generally not active or they're in their uh, egg stage or even larva stage. And so if you're creating new wounds in these trees, which you are doing when, you, when you're pruning, you're wounding the tree. Uh, sometimes that rings the dinner bell for, for pests. And a lot of times these pests will actually carry harmful funguses into the tree as they start to feed, which is in the case of like oat wilt, which is a big problem in the central part of our state. So to avoid that, you can prune in the winter and uh, it's less of a concern. Also you know, pruning in the summertime, for those of you guys have have done it on your own. It's just hot out there. It's not fun. And sometimes you run into the bees' nests or you get the wasps or the asp caterpillars coming at you. Sometimes there's snakes hanging out and uh, and uh, decayed part of trees. So all that stuff you don't really have to worry about in the winter, which is very nice. Some of the things to look for when you're pruning. Uh, these guys here are called co-dominant stems. It's basically if you have a tree it yeah, has two, two or more what it looks like competing trunks. Um, you know, this is a common sight if you're planting a crepe myrtle or something, but if you're planting an oak tree, this is not something you really want to see at the, at the early part of its life. Definitely not something you want to see out of a, a pot at the nursery. But as you can see over here, you just want to, on these young trees, just select the trunk that you think has a little bit better natural branching structure or seems to be out competing the other one maybe a little bit more and just eliminate the other trunk as low as you can uh, down to the soil line or wherever those trunks meet. Uh, similar to that here, we get a lot of suckers and water sprouts. You know, they're, they're all just epicormic shoots, you know, fast growth. The suckers are the stuff that comes from the ground. The water sprouts come from a little higher up in the tree. Uh, this is a good time when the tree's year one or two to come out there and start forming what you want that tree to look like as an adult. So take out those co-dominant stems, Maybe start cleaning out some of the lower canopy. These young trees will bounce back very quickly from aggressive pruning. Uh, there is a, there is kind of a rule of pruning in the, the forestry world. Um, a lot of people say don't prune more than 25% of the total wood volume or canopy of the tree in one year. Uh, you could get a little bit more aggressive with these young trees, but uh, definitely when you get into mature tree pruning, that's kind of a good uh, guideline to follow because it is causing damage to the trees. It is shocking its food produce, producing mechanism by pruning out a lot of canopy. So try not to do more than 25% in one year on a mature established tree. Right, a lot of times you get uh, competing trunk leaders as you get a little higher up in the tree here. And the picture on the left looks like you have two guys vying for the top spot. I would just clip one of those off uh, about where they meet on the trunk and let the other one form into a nice tree form. Otherwise, you get stuff like you see on the right uh, when you get real low branches with competitive uh, leaders, especially in hardwoods. That's when you tend to get a lot of splitting in the trunk and things like that uh, during heavy winds. Uh, a lot of times, uh, whether it's a couple trunks meeting together and splitting off or even major branches coming off the trunk, what you really want to see for better structure is um, you want to avoid seeing a V. They call that a V crotch, which inevitably ends up like the picture on the right there. And a lot of times you'll see a little bark ridge forming between that V. Uh, that's a sign of uh, potential instability in the tree. Bradford pears are a great example of that. Next time you go to a Bradford pear, kind of look at what's going on uh, towards the main trunk. They seem to like find a spot about six, seven feet up, and then they all decide they want to be the, the lead trunk over there. And they create a lot of these V crotches, real tight crotches. And then as you guys probably experienced, they start breaking apart real quickly. So the U kind of shape is really what you want to see between branches or different trunks coming out, that U crotch. Other things to look for as far as pruning is uh, we have fall webworm and there's also springtime stuff, tent caterpillars, mimosa caterpillars, a lot of stuff out there. You know, generally these things aren't fatal to the tree. Uh, they definitely can 
can uh, colonize sections of the tree and, and make it difficult for those uh, particular leaves to access light or they'll defoliate them by eating them. Um, it's really this more of an aesthetic problem though. But what you can do is if you have isolated patches of that stuff that's just driving you crazy, just prune out that branch. Get rid of those, um, those uh, colonies. Or I see some people, they just poke, poke at the webs. And that allows the natural predators of those caterpillars to come in there and start eating on them. Either way, it's pretty effective, but it's a part of nature out here. I wouldn't be too concerned. Same with the bagworm that's the bottom left there. You're going to commonly see that on cypresses, uh, cedars, arborvitaes, things like that. Uh, it will defoliate slightly. I've, I've only once seen it actually defoliate a whole tree. It was, and I think it was something else actually bothering that tree that made it a, a welcome invitation. But a, a fun little game you can play if those things are, are driving you crazy is don't try to chemically treat them. It's very difficult. You have to hit them just as they're coming out of those cocoons in the spring, which is very hard to time. Uh, get your kids or grandkids out there pulling those things. They'll pull right off the thing and give them a nickel for every time they pull it off. Uh, ball moss, that's, that's pretty common here. It's that picture in the middle. Uh, it's non-parasitic, so it's not actually feeding off the tree. It's just opportunistic. It likes to be under thick canopy. Seems to love crepe myrtles, seems to love cedar elms. That's another one of those deals. Get those kids out there pulling that stuff off. They'll come right off without much effort. Uh, if you have some branches that are just completely covered in that stuff, you barely see leaves anymore, you could consider pruning that branch out. Um, you, there are some chemical treatments you can try. Again, the window of effectiveness it is, is pretty small in the spring. Uh, Copper-based algicides seem to be working. I've heard of people using baking soda, all this other stuff. I've tried to do it a few times with limited success, and it's often more time-consuming than anything else. But again, that's a non-parasitic uh, algae-like organism. Mistletoe, however, is parasitic. It is actually feeding off of the uh, cambium layer of these trees. Uh, generally, they, they're not really the cause of death for a lot of trees, but I, I do notice that if trees are, are naturally suffering from something else, mistletoe seems to like to colonize it. It seems to like to stay on the same host. It doesn't really spread readily or quickly to adjacent trees unless they're intermingling branches and things like that. Seems to love hackberries more than anything else, which is, again, one of our kind of native garbagey types of trees. Uh, you can prune those out. Uh, it's very difficult to actually prune out the mistletoe. You, you generally have to prune out the, the whole branch or that section of branch to get it out of there. That will slow it down at least. Galls. Um, galls are basically <clears throat> the tree's reaction to insects going in there and uh, penetrating the wood and laying their eggs. So it's not actually an egg sac. It's, it's a hormonal reaction by the tree itself that creates this kind of uh, deformity and sometimes it's the it's in the woody part of the tree like the stems or the branches sometimes it's in the leaves I'm sure you see all kinds of little bumps and and uh, doohickeys all over your leaves uh, through different times of year not something to be concerned of in fact a lot of the insects that sometimes lay their eggs and cause this type of gull are beneficial so a lot of them are parasitic wasps that will go after things like aphids or mites which are the true killers of trees so if you it's it's an aesthetic thing. If it really bothers you, you can prune them out. But personally, I leave them. Uh, fire blight can be a real problem, especially in our, our uh, pear trees, ornamental and fruit producing. Uh, very difficult to control. Usually by the time you've noticed you've had fire blight, it's, it's generally too late because you'll see half the tree has just died on you all of a sudden, usually around early summer. Uh, if you do have some prized pear trees, or apricot trees, something like that in, in your yard and you want to prevent that fire blight, you can hit them with an algicide fungicide just as those leaves are, are starting to form in the spring. That's when you can start spraying for that and uh, it'll help contain that fire blight, which is a bacterial disease. Uh, if you start to notice that on like a pear tree that just a small section is being discolored and is showing signs of like what you see in that picture, you can try to prune that out but I would definitely clean off your blade with just like a, a bleach water solution after you've cut because you might still have some of that bacteria on your blade and you could take it to a different part of the tree and spread it. Any time of year is a good time of year to uh, clean out deadwood. 
you know, some plants like pines and a lot of hardwoods that are that have cast heavy shade, they'll naturally prune themselves. I'm sure you pick up branches all the time, uh, just fallen um, shade pruning themselves. That's fine. You can get on top of that time of any year. Just take extra caution when you're pruning that stuff because they're unstable branches. All right, so you learned, uh, we learned a little bit earlier that pruning is wounding the tree. It is causing damage to the tree and it can promote insect activities, kind of ringing the dinner bell for the, those insects and sometimes the fungus comes along with them. But trees do actually have a very good natural defense against that. And uh, a lot of times they'll start putting this uh, natural reaction of uh, defensive mechanisms into play, you know, one to three days after pruning. So it's a pretty quick reaction. And, uh, you know, it's, it manifests in different ways, like pines will put, set out resin right away, which basically stops any insects from coming in. It, it uh, infiltrates that. And uh, every tree will do what's, what's commonly called uh, compartmentalization. So it builds walls around open wounds and it, it effectively, uh, you hope that it effectively uh, contains decay that forms from that wounded wood by building this, this box around the decay area. The decay will always be in the tree. That wound will always be in the tree, but it kind of isolates it. It jails that decay. So as far as how to prune, here's your guides. You have your, uh, branch, your branch bark ridge, which you can see in this picture, it's kind of that that ridgy piece of uh, bark that's kind of coming out and flaking. And then there's also a branch collar. It's more of an inflammation, like a funnel looking shape. Uh, it's sometimes more evident on different types of trees uh, rather than others. Like on crepe myrtles, it's kind of hard to detect this a lot, but on oaks, usually you can see these things pretty readily. Uh, but these are, are two really important guides when it comes to pruning. Um, I'll show you over here. Here's a, a real time example here. You see a, a really defined branch bark ridge there, that, that bark kind of coming together there. I call that the point of no return. You don't want to cut past that, that ridge into the trunk of the tree. That causes a lot of problems, makes it very difficult for that tree to heal on its own. The guide is going to be that collar. You can kind of see how it funnels out and then it kind of turns into this straight path for that branch. We're right at the edge of that collar is the perfect spot where you want to make that final cut. That's the best possible location on a branch um, to prune that tree and have it naturally heal on its own. So here's your ABCs as far as pruning. First, you find that ridge. Again, that's the point of no return. And then you wanna find that collar. So you know, okay, this is about where I wanna make that last cut, the last cut. The first cut you're gonna make is gonna be away from that. So you can see on this diagram here, uh, number A, that's out about two or three inches from where you know you're gonna make your final cut, your C cut. The reason we're doing that is it's an undercut. You wanna go in maybe about 20 to 25% of the diameter into that branch. And then you wanna come slightly above that undercut and maybe a little bit outward, then go ahead and finish that cut. And you're gonna notice as you get about halfway through that branch on that top cut, it's just gonna pop right off once it hits that. You're not gonna have your saw pinched, and it's gonna take away a lot of the weight of that branch or trunk that you're trying to, to prune out, which is good because you don't want that thing to swing back and hit you and you don't want it to tear along the trunk of the tree. So we make a three point cut, hitting that undercut first, come slightly above it and outward, release all that weight of the most of the branch. And then all you have left is this little nub where you can come and make your final cut right at the branch collar. That's absolutely the best way to plant for the tree's safety and for yours. So here's a real time uh, picture example here. Our buddy, he's making his little undercut. You can't really see the, the branch uh, bark ridge or the collar in that picture, but trust me, he's, he's away from it. Then on that B slide, he's showing the overcut and you can kind of see how that, that tree, it stops peeling bark as soon as it hits that undercut. So it's not going to peel bark off that main trunk. Then he nice and easily comes and makes his, his final cut with C over there. That's the way to go. If you don't do it, this is a lot of times what you're going to see. And this is sometimes the way you can gauge between a, a good arborist and a bad arborist if you're looking to hire one is see if uh, his work looks like this. If you get a lot of tears on the trunk, you can see on the on the left side there, inevitably ends up like something on the right where the tree is really trying to heal over on its own, but it's really struggling because it's got a lot of surface area to recover from. Other things I see a lot is uh, 
the flush cut you see on the left there, that's what happens if you, if you start pruning past that uh, branch bark ridge. Uh, it's going to be very difficult for that tree to heal over. Uh, some people leave stubs where they've gone out a little too far from that branch collar, and that promotes a lot of decay. It's, it's difficult for the tree to heal over there. And then really bad in the whole Houston area is this lion's tailing, like you see on the right. Um, but that, that's really hard for the trunk to taper. I guess there's this common misconception that I uh, hear from people saying, oh, we're going to get all these leaves out of the inside of the tree. So all that wind can pass through there. It's going to be better in storms and all this other good stuff. It's exactly the opposite. Reality is all those, those inner leaves, all that outer canopy, that, that lower canopy, that actually acts as a deflective shield from a lot of these major storms. It diverts the wind around the tree and it helps protect those major branches from splitting. So if you get a, a tree like the one on the right here, it's so top heavy and there's nothing to protect that trunk. And uh, that's a prime candidate to get split on a major windstorm. All right, if, if you could take one thing home with you guys today is never, never top a tree. That's basically when you indiscriminately cut all the branches on the tree, you probably see it all over the place on these crepe myrtles. Let me show you what happens when you do that. So that top left, you're seeing somebody just freshly topped. I don't know what kind of tree that is, maybe maple or something. And uh, the next year, of course, you get all those shoots. That's like the desperate recovery of that tree, trying to get its canopy back. If you take a closer look at the, the shoots there, you're going to see a lot of decay on where those, those cuts are made. And that decay is obviously a big problem for stability of the tree. And then we get what we call that witch's broom on the bottom right, which is the cut point and then all these little suckers. And I promise you, all those new branches that have formed uh, from that cut area are not as strongly attached as an original branch. So uh, a lot of people will say, oh, I've got to cut, i got to top this tree. It's going to fall on my house and destroy everything. Well, the reality is the stuff that's sprouting back is much more of a risk than the stuff that was there originally. So I'm going to make you guys, uh, if you're still awake out there, do the Pledge of Allegiance here. A Pledge of Allegiance to the trees of my property. From this day forward, I'll never top my trees. That includes crepe myrtles, everybody. And I know you're going to hate me for saying that. All right. So uh, inevitably, what you want to see is the donut on the tree. This is, this is that wound wood forming over the fresh cut. And it's forming over. And it's going to make a solid barrier. Again, it's walling itself off from that, that decay area, that dead area now in the tree. That's, that's a beautiful sight. Uh, here's a more of a real time example of, of what you might see on a lot of hardwoods. Year one, you've got the fresh cut and you can kind of see that donut starting to form around the perimeter of the cut. Year two, it's getting a little thicker than even thicker. And then after four years, it's a solid chamber. And uh, that's actually much harder wood than the original wood. Very difficult to cut through that. That's called wound wood. Uh, some people are all hung up on painting their wounds. Honestly, I wouldn't put the time or effort into it. Uh, if you absolutely have to paint a wound, I would only do it if you're, say, in an area like uh, if you're out a little bit of central Texas and oak wilt's a huge problem in like uh, the warmer season, or they say Valentine's Day to July 4th, then you might put an asphalt based paint on there and get it out of a spray can or you can brush it on. Uh, uh, you can get some of it at specialty nurseries and online nurseries. I, I never use this stuff. Um, I think you're kind of wasting your time with this. The, Making the right cut in the right spot is definitely the best way to go. And as far as fertilizers go, you know, think of them as bandages. You don't know what's going on with your soil until you actually do a soil test and, you know, give it that Texas tree look around, taking a look at drainage and all that, uh, looking at other plants that seem to be doing well there. You know, for $10 to $15, you can get a soil test, send it over to A&M Soil Lab, and they'll tell you your, your pH levels, your NPK levels. Uh, I think in the basic test, they give you salt uh, levels as well, or you can go to that, that $25 grade or whatever and get all your micronutrients. So it can tell you exactly what's going wrong. Uh, a lot of people want to fertilize the heck out of a tree at time of planting. It can be counterproductive. Uh, what I've seen is over fertilization can actually attract more insects to the tree. Uh, some dangerous feeding excess because it's got really strong uh, flushes of leaves really quickly and it's very attractive and easy for those insects to get at them. So I would avoid it if at all possible. And then finally, if you're going to go out and hire somebody to, to prune your tree, whether it's a young tree or old tree, 
you know, don't don't be shy when you're talking to these guys. Just because they have a uh, you know tree expert written on the side of their truck doesn't mean anything. Um, definitely ask them if they're insured, and I'm not talking about car insurance. I'm talking about insurance from property damage. Um, ask them, hey, have you pruned anybody's trees in my yard? Uh, after today's presentation, you should all be a little bit more informed of what to look for and what to avoid seeing. So if you see them making flush cuts on your neighbor's tree or lion's tailing or topping your neighbor's tree, save your money, please. Uh, will they guarantee your new tree if they're doing a tree planting in your house? Most of them should at least give you a one year warranty on that tree. And um, you can ask them if they have a certified arborist on staff. There, there's no state, federal, or municipal licensing, uh, professional licensing of arborists, as far as I know, in Texas, and definitely none of Fort Bend County. Uh, so really, there's only one nationally recognized credential for, for proper arborist pre profession, and that's the International Society of Arboriculture. So you can ask them, hey, are you an ISA certified arborist or like in the, the city here, I, I won't hire out any jobs to any arborist that at least don't have one as a supervisor on staff. That generally uh, tells me that they're a little bit more informed on the latest knowledge of uh, tree care and uh, pests and diseases out there and safe work practices and all that other good stuff. Generally, you get a, a little bit more trustworthy person. Okay, so Got a little bit of time left for uh, for questions. I, I know I talked you guys this year off. You probably have to get a little break or something like that. But uh, uh, we'll we'll power some questions now. I've got my information over there. Uh, feel free to reach out to me if you don't get your question answered today. Um, Nancy's got this uh, survey for you coming up here. Let's see if I can pull up. Oh, there we go. I guess you can scan that into your phone. And uh, A and M loves their surveys, so don't let them down. And I want to thank Nancy and uh, Suma for setting this up. I wish I could see your all's faces uh, maybe next year. But I uh, hope you enjoyed. I hope you learned one thing or, or made you laugh at least once today. And I thank you all for, for being here today. Thank you so much, Paul. That was wonderful. It was uh, such a great uh, talk, and I learned a lot. I'm sure a lot of people learned. And actually, you guys can... Uh, uh, show your faces now, now that the recording is over. Right, Nancy? They can do it now. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. So there are some questions in the chat. I'll run those questions first. And if people have any more, they can unmute themselves and ask. So the first one was from Jennifer. And she her question is, what fast growing shade tree would be good near a playground? Yeah, I mean, uh, pound for pound in Fort Bend County, if you have the space and if you can continuously prune it, live oak is unstoppable. It's, it's almost a weed, it grows so well. But again, you have to have the space and you have to anticipate near a playground, uh, it does want to spread outward and downward. So if it's in your own yard, something like that, anticipate you're going to have to prune that thing every year to kind of keep it off of the play area. Uh, in general, though, oaks are a fine choice for that. Um, you know, if, if you don't want something that spreads as much as a live oak, I've been doing a lot with uh, Mexican white oak. Some people call it Monterey oak, uh, polymorphous oak. Uh, Chisos oak is also a very good one. Schumard oak is pretty good. Sometimes it struggles a little bit in our soils here. Um, same with water oak. It can struggle if it's a highly manipulated site. But uh, generally, those are pretty good trees for that kind of area. Okay, she is also asking: Is crepe myrtle a good uh, plant for that? For a uh, for a um, playground playground area? Yeah, it can be. I mean, uh, it, it ends up being more of a large shrub or small tree, depending on which variety you put in there. So. It's, it's fine. What, I, what I've noticed from my own daughters is wherever we go someplace where there's a crepe myrtle, usually there's two or three trunks, and that's like the instant thing for them to go start climbing. So I've had to rescue <laughs> a lot of more crepe myrtles than any other tree out there. Yeah. So just anticipate that those smaller trees that have lower branches will become part of play. Yeah, yeah. But they're not uh, evergreen, kind of. No, they're, they're deciduous trees. So they're, yeah. they're not going to look very good in the wintertime. Right, right. So the second question was, I think, more a question of curiosity about uh, the person, the native persimmon, and you showed the fall color. And just like her, I also moved from East Coast. I miss fall colors a lot. So she's asking, is that color really 
really true? Do we see that deep colors here? Yeah, you can out of the native persimmon here. Now those other, other varieties I mentioned, the Texas persimmon and, um, and Mexican persimmon, you're not gonna get that color. Because yeah. they're gonna be more semi-deciduous, so they'll actually keep their leaves if we have a mild winter. And if they do drop them, it's gonna be a pretty quick drop. You're not gonna get much color out of them. But the native persimmon will drop consistently. It will have a much larger, fleshier leaf. And when that chlorophyll starts um, leaving that leaf, you get that really brilliant color. Now that was an excellent picture of that color. Uh, you're probably going to get better color in the upper Midwest than you would here, but it, it is one of our more colorful uh, forest plants down here. Yeah. Um, are the all the top ten uh, trees that you mentioned are they safe to plant uh, closer to the foundation? Yeah. So all, most of those small class trees, they're not going to have uh, very large aggressive roots. I'm not saying that if your foundation has cracking, you won't get roots in there, but they're not going to be nearly as aggressive as you know oaks or pecans or any other pretty much any other hardwood tree or even pine trees so most of those are safe uh near hardscape i wouldn't plant anything within a foot of you know yeah. the side of your driveway or sidewalk or foundation that's, yeah that makes sense for trees you know you yeah. put a little if you want but uh yeah none of those are going to cause any major damage yeah um, this person bought a pomegranate straight from the nursery and she said it was a three foot tall and, but it died within a week of planting. So what potentially did she do wrong? Do wrong? Yeah, yeah, the biggest thing I've seen is issues with pomegranates is they're, they're, they tend to be a higher drier climate. So if you might have had too much moisture, you might have drowned it. Uh, that would be my first thought and the first thing I would look for is uh, go back to that site and if that's one that was holding water or if it was over irrigated, that definitely could be the, the coup de gras on a pomegranate. You want to have good drainage for those guys. Yeah, okay. Um, Lalita wants, her wish is to plant a weeping willow. She has a small yard. She wants to plant it 20 feet from her house, uh, but many people want her that the roots will be invasive. And I said, like, weeping willow does grow very big. So what is your opinion? Yeah, I'll tell you a little story about weeping willow. Uh, when, <laughs> I was a, when I was a student up in, uh, in Illinois, uh, one of our, our projects as a grad student is we had to follow a willow root. We had to excavate it and follow it as far as we could go. And I think I got about 200 feet away before I found the visible edge of that willow root. <laughs> <laughs> thing was, you know, 15, 15, 20 inches diameter. It wasn't even a full grown willow. So willows and cottonwoods in particular are probably the most expansive root systems and aggressive yeah. root systems. Okay. Most of the trees you'll see around here. I absolutely yeah. do not recommend planting that 30 feet from your house. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. You probably saved me from my foundation problems. <laughs> <laughs> so if you kind of like that weeping effect, Maybe look into the uh, that Ratama tree that I was talking about. It yeah, has kind Ratama of is a small one. Yeah, it's a smaller stature, not aggressive roots. It has like a really nice bright green trunk. And then it has this really thin kind of weepy type of look to it. Uh, there are thornless varieties of it, which I highly recommend. Uh, the, the natural variety is, is very thorny. But uh, you also get some really beautiful, like kind of a rain shower of yellow flowers throughout the uh, summer months as well. That's about the closest acceptable thing I would, I would recommend for the weeping type of look. Awesome. So Appreciate I saw a lot of Palo Verde when I went to Pacific Northwest, like California and Arizona, they were everywhere in spring. So I thought they were native only there, but they are native here also in Texas. Uh, I don't know if they'd be native to Fort Bend County, but yeah, if you go out to West Texas, they're all over the place. They're like mesquites out there. Uh, so they, they do do okay over here. They need drainage. They will not tolerate a lot of flooding and they can be prone also to uh, frost damage. So if we get a heavy frost like we did two years ago, uh, they do yeah. die back. Yeah. Okay, if anybody has any more questions. Um, 
Suma, I got a question directly to me. Can you prune suckers now or wait until the winter? Yeah, you can do it now. Um, you know, suckers, I, I'm less concerned about pruning suckers as far as, you know, attracting insects and diseases than I am major branches and things like that. So uh, it, it's fine to do suckers now. And the reality is if some of these trees like crepe myrtle trees or vitexes or viburnums, if, you, if you're trying to form those into a tree looking tree rather than a shrub, you're gonna have to prune that thing about two or three times a year because they're just such vigorous growers. Uh, like in our parks, I prune crepe myrtles, suckers, at least twice a year, at least. And for us, it's whenever you can. So I have a question. Oh, go ahead, Nancy. One other question. Should we prune for competing leaders in a pomegranate tree as well? I ask this because pomegranate has this shrub-like growth. Yeah, I've never seen anybody effectively make a tree form pomegranate. It is it's super shrubby. I mean, yeah. the, the best the best you can do is if you can get it down to three or four trunks, that's the victory. So I, I answered this because I took a pruning class on fruit trees and what they recommend for pomegranates is to get it down to four branches and to direct all your branches out because for pomegranates to fruit, they need sunlight. So you wanna get a vase shape and you have to continuously cut off suckers. So you're generally just pruning that all the time. Yeah, from a fruit standpoint, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, another factor to consider is that they could get very top heavy and susceptible to windbreak. So if they're in an area where they're not very sheltered, um, you definitely want to keep it more shrubby. Uh, that's what naturally they don't want to be very tall because they break very easily, especially when they're fruiting, which is a very long fruiting period with a lot of pomegranates. So I get a lot of breakage on them. I get a lot of trunks that fall apart, um, you know, from even just mild winds when they're in full fruit. Um, can you recommend any small evergreen trees for our area, Paul? For what? Small evergreen trees for Fort, Fort Bend County area. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, a lot of the stuff that I mentioned was uh, was evergreens there, like the Japanese black pine, if you're into the pine trees. Uh, some of them are, are um, you know, semi-deciduous, like some of those um, persimmons and things like that. Um, definitely the little gem magnolia is one of my favorite evergreen small trees that also happens to flower very well. So there, there's a lot of good choices for evergreens, but evergreen, again, is, is kind of a deceptive thing for us here because our winters can go either way. We could either have basically endless summer as far as the tree's concerned, or we can have those cold snaps where they defoliate. So um, it really depends on, on the other qualities that you're looking for the trees. Because a lot of what's labeled as deciduous might actually be close to evergreen here. Any, anyone else for questions? You can unmute yourself and ask. It's a right time to do that. Okay, uh, nobody... One more question. Uh, go, ahead. Oh, go ahead, Lalita. No, no, no. I, I'll, I'll speak after. Uh, I have one more question. A bird dropped a magnolia and uh, it's actually growing maybe 10 feet from my pole. It's about uh, three, four feet now. And I heard that the roots are quite strong and they may actually crack the pole. Is that true? Yeah, in general, uh, it, you know, a lot's going to depend here on whether it's like the, the true native southern magnolia, which, you know, those things get 50, 60 feet tall over the course of 100 years. But if it's, you know, an offspring of one of these dwarf magnolias, I wouldn't worry about it if it's a dwarf at all. But magnolia roots can be pretty strong, but they're also very fleshy. They don't really develop that hardwood exterior that a lot of other hardwood trees, shade trees, develop. So if you if you put a magnolia root next to a an oak tree root, you would definitely see the difference. Um, 
much more flesh, fleshy, therefore, I think a lot less intrusive as far as hardscape. Okay. And I, I think everybody has had a chance to do the survey now. So you know, I'll put my info back up here. If, uh, if you had a question that you were dying to get answered and you were too shy or whatever today, go ahead and shoot me an email, give me a call. And um, you know, I can uh, answer some questions that way. If, if you have specific issues with trees, I tell people, you know, I can't come to your yard. I'm a, a public servant, but um, if they email me some really clear photos, sometimes I can do some diagnostic work that way. And if it's something I can't ident identify, I can always recommend three or four different arborists for hire that have done great work for us and that you could give them a shot in your yard. Great, excellent. Thank you so much, Paul. Uh, we can't thank you enough for taking time uh, and doing this uh, for us. And we have learned a lot and we hope to see more of you next year. All right. Well, I'll send you my bill soon, okay? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Thank you all. I on on behalf of everybody, I don't know